All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Finance, a weekly series that I host discussing everything that I found interesting this week in the news within the finance world. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and dive into everything that I found interesting. I'm going to discuss those topics, give you my thoughts, my opinions, and I ask that you just leave one small thing, a like. Hit like on this video if you are listening to this on the podcast version, share it with a friend, and let's go ahead and dive into today's episode of This Week in Finance. As always, there are timestamps below. If you so choose to hop around the stories, you can do that using those timestamps. But the first story that we have is the Kroger Albertsons story. This was covered last week in finance. So if you want to go ahead and hear the initial story, my thoughts, my opinions, you can do so there. But I posted that video. I'm sorry. I recorded that video on a Thursday. I post these videos on Sundays. And as a result of that, I kind of missed that Friday piece. It has to come into this week's video. Well, this is coming into this week's video. The deal closed. As of the time of recording last week, it didn't close. It did close. Now, I don't say close, but um, it's official, I should say. The closing of this deal is really why I'm bringing this story back up again. It's going to be difficult. It is not going to be a walk in the park. And the reason is, Federal regulators do not necessarily want to see this happen. There have already been politicians that have spoke out, specifically Bernie Sanders um, and I think Miss Warren have already spoke out against this merger because of the fact that they feel it will A, reduce competition and B, increase the prices that Kroger can then charge. This deal will bring Kroger up to the second largest grocer in the country behind Walmart. And of course, people don't want to see, I think it was number two and number four or whatever positions they were in that ranking. I don't know. You can rank them in different different ways. You can rank them by like just grocery store or by revenue. And obviously Walmart's going to win by revenue. But either way, this bumps them up to number two on that list. So I wanted to dive into some of the details for Kroger and Albertson's merger. So you can see here, the two companies deliver a combined $210 billion in revenue, $3.3 billion in earnings, and $11.6 billion of adjusted EBITDA. They think that the combined capabilities will accelerate the growth of what they call the alternative profit businesses. They expect synergies of up to a billion dollars for the first four years following the close, 50% achieved within the first two years, yada, yada, all of this stuff. What I found really interesting was this. The expected closing is in 2024. But between the now and then, they are going to plan to divest some of Albertsons, but not in the traditional way. Initially, I was assuming that Albertsons would sell its locations off, maybe kind of close them down, sell the cash for other businesses and move about their day. I'm going to read this because it's interesting. I don't want to mess it up. As a mechanism to accomplish store divestitures in certain areas, so that's getting rid of those locations, Albertsons is prepared to establish a subsidiary to be spun off of Albertsons shareholders or to Albertsons shareholders. So what that means is before Albertsons goes bust, not really, before it gets combined with Kroger, they're going to create a subsidiary company and then spin it off right before the deal closes and then Albertsons will get kind of eaten up or or merged with Kroger. So Albertsons is going to form another company, that company called Spinco, at least for now, obviously they're going to have to make a name for it, but they say that Spinco would be a new agile competitor with quality stores, experienced management, operational flexibility, and a strong balance sheet and a focused allocation of capital and resources to provide customers with continued value and quality service and associates with ongoing compelling career opportunities. Basically, Albertsons and Kroger know they're going to have to spin off some part of Albertsons to get this deal to go through. They're going to have to divest something because if they don't, they're going to come in with much too strong right, of a company for these regulators. You can see their footprint here covers the entire country besides Minnesota, which is dominated by Target, and it looks like no stores, and I believe this is Iowa. 
other than that, and Florida, which they might have one right here, which Florida is dominated by Publix. Other than that, they touch 85 million households, nearly 5,000 stores, almost 4,000 pharmacies, 2,000 fuel centers, 710,000 employees, 34,000 private labels. You get the gist. I could read the rest of the things here, but I'm not going to. The point being is Albertsons knows they have to do something. So rather than sell out their employees who are currently working there and sell them into different locations, my guess is some of the management stays with the spin coat company and the people who are currently working at those stores get to stay as well. But the big driver here, they create another immediately competitive grocery store. So now regulators are not only having to look at the fact that they're getting rid of the, some of their stores to existing places. No, 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 that's not the case. We're actually going to create a whole new company that's going to directly compete against us. So there's their one up for you, right? This is the plan between Kroger and Albertsons. I don't know if it's going to work. I'm interested to see if it works. Again, this isn't expected to close till 2024. And of course, that is pending federal regulation, which is the whole stick up here and the exact stick up with Spirit and JetBlue. I'm not going to harp on this one too much. It is essentially the exact same thing as Kroger and Albertsons. They just federal regulators want to see that, hey, are you going to jack up prices? Are you going to make this an anti-competitive space? Spirit and JetBlue merging will now create the fifth largest air carrier in the country. Of course, JetBlue has already announced if we get Spirit, which they just did, Spirit shareholders now approve, they're going to do away with Spirit. So no more yellow planes, no more banana planes, no more bright letters and cheap ticket this and all of this stuff, that kind of the howdy or whatever it was that went along um, with Spirit, it's all gone. It's going to be eaten up by JetBlue, a more premium style or feeling brand, at least to me personally. This is going to be another interesting one because I don't think there's as much diversity in the space of airliners as there is in grocery stores. You have Walmart, you have Target, you have Aldi, Publix, um, where else did I mention? Obviously, Kroger and Albertsons currently separate, not going to be separate for long, at least that's not the plan. And you could probably think of seven off the top of your head right now that I'm not mentioning. Whole Foods is one, Amazon sells separate from Whole Foods as well. There's so many different grocery stores, Costco, Sam's Club, you get the point. It's a lot more diverse of a space than the airline industry. And for that reason, I almost feel that this one has less of a chance than the Kroger one. Although I think in actuality, Kroger and Albertsons is probably going to have a more difficult time. I think there's a way in which you can, with efficiency, you can lower prices in the airline industry. And I think that you kind of have to, there's always going to be a new competitor coming in, buying up some airplanes and trying to charge a cheaper price in the grocery industry. You're kind of handcuffed to the price of the goods, but by consolidating the industry, you might have less opportunity for new goods to be brought in or for unique um, suppliers to kind of come into the fold. Because when you get scale, you pick your people and, yeah, so I believe in my brain that Kroger and Albertsons has a harder time. I believe in my heart that JetBlue and Spirit might have a little bit more difficult of a time. Now, people who are having a difficult time is really everybody in the world, but in particular, at least the one we're going to focus on, I shouldn't say in particular, um, the one we're going to focus on is Americans. 66% of American workers now claim they are worse off financially than they were a year ago. This, of course, due to inflation. Another very interesting statistic, nearly one in three workers, including those that make more than $100,000 a year, run out of money before payday or live paycheck to paycheck. Now, the 66% of American workers worse off makes sense to me. Inflation is running rampant. It still exists and it's still ever present. But living paycheck to paycheck when you make over $100,000 is not necessarily a, t a sign of the times, but potentially the way in which you manage your money. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should be well off and that this should be a cut and dry deal and you should be okay. But with $100,000, I think we can all agree that you have a little bit more flexibility in your budget. 
and you don't have to be spending as much as you are unless you made some poor financial decisions along the way. Now, other interesting statistics that go along with that is people are dipping into cash reserves or taking out debt to fund this. The stats here show that nearly three quarters or 72% of consumers have less in their savings than a year ago. Um, and then 29% say they have just wiped that savings out completely. This report based off of just 500 individuals, but nonetheless, the same thing. Of course, the same one in three workers saying they're running out of money before their next paycheck. That's not only a financial literacy problem, a financial education problem. We are failing people in this country as a whole in terms of financial education, maybe because I've gotten involved in this space or maybe because it's actually gotten more popular, but it does seem that financial education and financial literacy is becoming more normalized. States are legalizing or not legalizing, but requiring legally that classes be taught on personal finance before high school graduates do actually graduate. I believe that it should be taught probably in college. I mean, I'm taking basic level algebra or had to take basic level algebra over again. Why am I taking that? I should be taking some form of high level, high understanding personal finance class because unfortunately the Federal Reserve and what it does with interest rates affects everybody. But basically nobody likes to actually learn about it and take the time to understand how it affects them. Just saying. Moving forward, despite this hardship with inflation on Americans themselves, American companies are seemingly doing well. I won't say they're doing perfect, but of the four companies we're going to take a look at, every single one of them beat on earnings expectations, two of them missed on revenue expectations, but in general there is a expectation that earnings will not continue to be good. I believe that Procter & Gamble is a great company, and they have a lot of diversity amongst their product line. I think they are semi-delusional that they think Americans are going to continue to pay higher prices. It's not whether they choose to, it's just that they won't be able to. So Procter & Gamble reported good earnings. I'm a shareholder in this company. $1.57 earnings per share versus that $1.54 expected and a beat on revenue just slightly $20.61 billion versus $20.28 billion expected. Now, volume did not increase for all of their products. In fact, it only increased for one of them. Volumes dropped all across the board in all different product lines for this company. Now, they did make up. Obviously, they beat on revenue and on earnings expectations. They did make up for that. Um, by higher prices. So they grew shares, or not shares, I should say, sales within each of their divisions by raising the prices. And yet they claim that the consumer is strong and they believe they're going to be able to withhold this. Said here from Andre, we feel very good about the consumer reaction to our price increases because we don't see any major trade downs. Give that a month. Give that two months. If this is true, this will not continue to happen. That's just my personal opinion, though. And I like Procter & Gamble. I want Procter & Gamble to do well, but the problem is I just don't see that moving forward. The next company on the list, Netflix reported over this past week, added over 2.4 million subscribers and beat on EPS and revenue. $3.10 of EPS versus $2.13 expected, $7.93 billion of revenue versus $7.837 billion expected. As I mentioned, addition of 2.41 million subscribers versus roughly a million that was expected now. This is a good number and the market really liked that number. That expected global paid net subscriber number, they really liked it. The stock shot up, yeah, here it is, 14% after they reported that earnings. Jim Cramer came out and said, oh my gosh, which for those of you who don't know, Jim Cramer is a, he hosts a show called Mad Money on CNBC, he comes out and says, they're back on track, we should be buying the stock on the next major dip. No, 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 no. This is the same exact company that it was before, but people came back because they released good shows. It's going to be an ebb and flow. Now, they did release, or are releasing, I should say, in November, their new ad-supported tier. And this could either do one of two things. It could do really well to attract new customers, as I believe it will, 
but will they see the demand for advertising on the other side of it? They said they sold out almost all of their slots initially. Maybe that was Disney. Either way, I, I believe someone from Netflix came out and said demand is strong on the advertising side. With that being said, I'm not sure it's going to stay. I'm not saying it's going to go away completely, but I'm also not saying it's going to be, you know, rainbows and, and glitter because I just don't think that it's going to be. We know that the world, the economy, the U.S. economy is going to roll over this tipping point at some point. I feel like we're kind of balancing on the edge of things right now. The holiday season is going to come in. Spending might potentially keep up because of that. But after that, if people really do go out and spend a lot in the economy because we know the rates are going to keep going up, the economy gets tighter, things are not going to look that great. Sunshine and rainbows is not going to be happening. Glitter and rainbows are not going to be happening for Netflix. It's just not going to be the case. Companies like Snapchat, who also reported earnings, as you can see, not the best reaction from the market, stated, we think macroeconomic headwinds are still coming our way. They said, we are finding that our advertising partners across many industries are decreasing their marketing budgets, especially in the face of operating environment headwinds, inflation-driven cost pressures, and the rising costs of capital. So what does that mean? It means a company that makes most of their money via advertising says, this isn't going to keep up. Revenue for Snapchat came in at $1.13 billion versus the $1.14 billion that was expected. They did beat on earnings. As I mentioned, all four companies did. They had eight cents of earnings. Whoopee! Nice. Cool. Um, they were expected to have either break even or lose a little bit of money. They didn't do that, but they kind of did. Their actual net loss went up to four or went up 400% to $360 million because of a restructuring charge. As we know, they want to cut costs. They're planning on getting rid of or have got rid of 20% of their staff because they cut different projects like Pixie, their little flying drone and all this other stuff really focusing in on what they actually need to be doing, which is creating a social platform in which people can communicate and then advertising on the back of that. The revenue grew 6% from one year earlier, meaning over the course of a whole year, they grew the total size of their sales by merely 6%. That's not necessarily good because the cost of Everything in the whole entire country has went up more than 6% over the past year. It's like 8.4% was whatever the latest inflation reading was. So you didn't keep pace on your earnings with inflation. That doesn't necessarily bode super duper well, at least in my personal opinion. Now, that being said, spending has decreased. And that is my exact point. Spending on advertising, which is exactly what this company does, has decreased, and that's why you see just a 6% increase. And of course, because they said the absolute obvious, the stock plummeted. I don't know why this was a huge surprise. I'm not sure if there was something in the weeds there that I didn't necessarily catch from this article, but 25% down on a, a miss. We knew they were going to miss. I mean, at least I expected them to miss. I almost tweeted something as a prediction. I just didn't. I wish I, wish I would have because now I'd have receipts that I thought they were going to miss. But either way, you're going to have to trust me. I believe they were going to miss. They did miss um, on one of their numbers. And it doesn't really matter if they beat on this earnings number or not. Stock's down 25%. So um, that's the outlook for Snapchat. Now, Tesla was the other company that did report. They had a miss on revenue, $21.45 billion versus $21.96 billion expected, but they did beat on earnings with uh, $1.05 of earnings versus $0.99 cents that was expected. Now, the company, or Elon Musk, I guess I should say, told everybody they are getting cars and they're moving them. They cannot keep up with demand, which is a good thing, a good problem to have for a company like this. He said the same thing about some of their uh, batteries, their, their storage batteries that they have. That business has kind of been shrinking. Looks like it took a small jump here um, from $866 million to $1.12 billion on that energy generation and storage section. Of course, revenue for the automotive segment just continues to do well, as expected. As long as they can continue to be efficient, they can continue to move cars out that door. 
Elon Musk said a couple of interesting things. I'm not going to harp on them too much. Obviously, we know he's going to be acquiring Twitter or potentially, I should say, acquiring Twitter. Seems as if he really wants to do that now, tweeting and talking a lot about it. Um, but he also said that he thinks Tesla's market cap could become more than Apple and Saudi Aramco combined. Which, if you didn't know, Saudi Aramco and Apple are the two largest companies on the face of the planet. And he thinks that Tesla could be bigger than both of them combined. He obviously says he doesn't think it's going to be easy. Um, and he's not even factoring in his new robot, the human robot. I forget what it's called. Um, but he basically stated that he believes the company over the long run could become worth more than those two. Now, unless Tesla shifts its focus, I don't believe that would ever be true. You're talking about an oil giant and a technology giant combined and you're an automotive company. So if the battery storage and energy generation stays a part of the company, if the automotive part continues to grow as electric vehicle adoption happens, and if they're able to do something with the Optimus, came to my head, the Optimus robot and large scale that and ship it to other companies and basically become fully automated as a company, terms of manufacturing, I believe they could come close to that. But unless Saudi Aramco goes away because of oil not being as relevant, I just don't see that happening. Moving forward, enough about company earnings. I want to talk about this last topic here, which is the emergence of content and commerce combining. Now, Gary V. I'll touch on this first. Gary Vee made a prediction, and he took this exact CNBC article we're going to discuss here in a second and said, quote, for many of you who produce content, I really believe commerce will become a bigger part of your life in the next decade. And for those who do commerce, the reverse. I believe we're already seeing this. Um, this is me, if you're listening, talking off of his quote now. I believe we're actually already seeing this happen. The things I'm going to show you are proof of that. However, on places like Twitter, on places like Instagram, on places like TikTok, we have seen content creators form partnerships and affiliate links with other businesses, and we've especially seen the commerce section form content. You have Gary V. You have entrepreneurs. You have people who want to be entrepreneurs and don't even have a business, but they're in the business of content creation as an entrepreneur. You're seeing people like Bryce Hall create their own drinks. Mr. Beast create his own candy bar, his own restaurant. The Nelk Boys creating their own drink. This is something Logan Paul and KSI creating their own drink. This is something that is now becoming ever more present and it's becoming adopted mainstream. And I think that's why Gary Vee wanted to point this out now, but this is his next big prediction. Essentially, what we have here is an announcement from the NFL and Amazon that a Black Friday game will be happening. For those of you who don't know or are not from America, the Black Friday event or the holiday, so to speak, here in the United States is the day after Thanksgiving, and it is the largest retail shopping holiday in the country. What's been happening as of late, because of supply chain pressures, are companies spreading out these sales over the course of a week, over the course of a month, over the course of a couple of days to reduce the amount of pressure on them. Now, either way, the NFL has announced that there will now be a game played after Thanksgiving on this holiday hosted by, nonetheless, Amazon. The numbers have been coming in from Thursday Night Football. I'm about to go watch it after this video, but they have been really, really good. The number here at the bottom of this article actually says 10.8 million weekly viewers on average for Thursday Night Football aired on Amazon. NFL probably sees that number and goes fantastic. You guys can now have the game or the, the game the day after Thanksgiving, which is also a very big football ho holiday in America. Forgot to, to mention that point. So to have a game on days back to back, A is pretty special because it only happens on Sunday and Monday. Now it's going to happen on Thursday or whatever day Thanksgiving is, and then the following day, I don't actually know what day of the week that is, but Amazon, the nation's largest e-commerce business, is now going to host a game on the largest retail holiday of the year. And Gary Vee makes this prediction that these two things 
commerce and content, content being the NFL football game and commerce being Amazon, are going to become one or become closer together. And then this dropped. A couple of days ago, Walmart announcing a content creator platform, basically in which they allow people to get easy affiliate links out to all of their other platforms and have a space where they can get curated Walmart products, links to those products, and get them out pretty much, at least based on my reading, exactly what Amazon has done before with Amazon affiliates. So, as someone in the content space, I'm curious about what's going to happen with the commerce space. I've been getting some things about potentially doing some merch. I'm interested in doing some merch. Let me know down below in the comments because this video and and podcast here is about to be wrapped up. Let me know in the comments or on Twitter, Instagram, or wherever else you want to follow me. Those links back here and in the description. Do you think that you would purchase merch? I have some customized shirts. I have some customized mugs. If you're interested in something like that, leave a link or a, I'm sorry, a comment down below or hit me on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching this video. I do appreciate it. If you learned something new, if you enjoyed it, if you were entertained or educated, leave a comment, leave a like, and hit the subscribe button. The friend group is ever growing and I do appreciate all of your support. I will see you all in this next one. Take care.